Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to our Ecoflora virtual seminar series. My name is Lydia Paradiso, and I'm a doctoral student at the New York Botanical Garden and a graduate fellow with the New York City Ecoflora Project. Ecoflora was first started at NYBG in 2017 with a grant from the Institute for Museum and Library Services. Ecoflora is a community science project that with three main goals, to investigate urban ecosystems and urbanization, to support open source biodiversity data, and to increase our understanding and appreciation of plant life. So far, over 30,000 observers have made nearly 900,000 observations of plants and their biotic partners in New York City and posted them to iNaturalist. About 60% of those 900,000 are of plants and fungi, while the remaining 40% are organisms like insects and animals that are act as pollinators, seed dispersers, and more. You can explore these observations on our project page on iNaturalist, which I will link in the chat. Each month, we also sponsor an EcoQuest challenge, which encourages New Yorkers to observe a particular species, group of plants, or interaction, and post those onto iNaturalist. Our February EcoQuest is entitled Flowers in February. There are a few native species and many more non-natives that flower in February. For example, um, common witch hazel, which generally blooms in the fall, but is known to bloom now as well, as well as snowdrops and ivy leaf speedwell. Uh, these flowers can act as important resources to pollinators during this otherwise sparse month. Many of these flowers are small uh, and somewhat inconspicuous, so make sure to take a close look and see how many you can find. So far, observations in the project have included some snowdrops and some very small purple lanium flowers. Our climate is changing um, and we're experiencing seasonal shifting with the first frost happening later and the first spring thaw happening sooner. Um, and these changes can have an effect on the timing of different uh, events, including flowering and fruiting. So iNaturalist observations can be a really powerful tool for collecting some of this plant phenology data um, because the timing for these things can be very sensitive to changes in climate and seasonality. And this can have a lot of effects, cascading effects in the ecosystem with things like plant pollinator mismatch um, and perhaps, you know, uh, lack, like not able to set seed, et cetera. Uh, so this month we're trying to uh, catalog some of these early blooming flowers to see if there's been any changes compared to our historical uh, record. And here is a link to the project page for that. If you've been following along with our EcoQuests, uh, check out our 2022 EcoFlora Year in Review document, um, which goes through all the EcoQuests from last year and highlights some cool observations and some uh, interesting findings. All right, last thing uh, before I turn over to Tomi to introduce our speaker. Um, we do have another talk that will be scheduled for the 20th. Um, we will be hosting um, Clara Pregitzer from the Natural Areas Conservancy. Um, so to stay up to date on that event and all of our future events, um, if you're not already on our mailing list, uh, you can use this link to get on that mailing list. All right, and with that, I'll turn it over to Tomi for the speaker introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> My name is Tomi. I am a project manager uh, for the EcoFlow project. Per usual, I'd like to start the seminar with a land acknowledgement by recognizing the original people of this land, the Lenape, as well as their deep connection to the Lenape home king homeland. Uh, as an organization dedicated to advocating for the more than human world, we must acknowledge those who are original stewards of the land. We believe in the importance of acknowledging the settler colonial genocide perpetrated against indigenous communities, as well as the resilience of the Lenape, who still today to continue to resist erasure. All right, so for our speaker tonight, our speaker is Dr. Jessica Rogers, an assistant professor in biology and environmental studies at the SUNY Potsdam. Potsdam. Her research interests were in landscape conservation, specifically using GIS to detect changes in protected areas, as well as examining practical methods of invasive species monitoring and eradication in New York. A native of Northern New York, Dr. Rogers received her undergraduate degree in conservation at Princeton University before moving up, moving to central Kenya to study zebra habitat use, specifically vegetation measures. Upon returning to New York, she worked for the Wildlife Conservation Society at the Bronx Zoo on international conservation. 
She then received her PhD in 2011 from Columbia University, where she studied deforestation in protected areas in Central Africa using remote sensing and GIS techniques. The interconnected interconnections of local lands and conservation were instilled in her growing up and were only improved by her time in Kenya, Gabon, and most of all, New York City. She continues to hike the Adirondacks and never misses a chance to return to New York City to catch something on Broadway. Tonight, Dr. Rogers will discuss her work on the invasive purple loose strike using new mapping techniques to identify the extent of infestations and to investigate factors that promote the spread of this plant. If you are unable to stay for the whole talk or you would like to share it with others, a recording will be posted to the NYBG YouTube page. You can also find recordings of past talks on both the Ecoflora and the Botanic Gardens pages. We can also find recording, oh, just to note, we will be transferring all of our content to the main New York Botanic Gardens YouTube channel in the near future. And I will now turn it over to Jessica. Thank you so much, Tomi. And thank you to everyone for joining tonight. Um, this is a great honor to be asked to speak. And I'm really excited to share my research with you. Um, I'll share my screen. So hopefully some of the pictures will be um, worth taking a look at. Um, hopefully you can see the correct screen now. Okay, thank you, Lydia. Um, so to talk about um, purple loosestrife, some of this, I wanna give you a little bit of background on myself and then I'll move through what purple loosestrife is and the work I've done. And most of this talk is organized as sort of a story of how I've done this research and what each of the steps can be. Um, SUNY Potsdam is really far up in Northern New York, as you can see from hopefully the next slide. Yes. Um, so we're about just under 300 miles north of New York City at this point. And most of what SUNY Potsdam does is a teaching university. I teach in an environmental studies department and focusing on that work involves a lot of practice and working with undergraduates. And so I spend a lot of time thinking about how to tell a story in my research. And so it starts with this story. Um, so I grew up in Potsdam. I'm seventh generation from the North Country. And to start with um, acknowledgement of the land, all the research of the work I've done is done on the unceded land from the Haudenosaunee people, specifically near the St. Regis Mohawk tribe with whom I started collaborating. Um, so I grew up in Potsdam. I was able to go as far south as I could handle and got to New Jersey to go to my undergrad and had a wonderful time there. And from there, I moved to Kenya. Um, I was asked to study zebras and worked for my undergrad advisor. Um, I got to spend some time touring around parts of Kenya and Southern Africa to get a sense of what conservation was like. What we were studying is whether these zebras um, were migrating, were spending time in different areas. I'm a landscape biologist by training, trying to look at big picture ideas across a landscape. And I would spend six days a week going out, begging these zebras to turn left so I could take a digital photograph of them and barcode each individual zebra up its neck to see how far they'd moved in a given set of years. And some of them had only moved 60 meters over the course of five years. They had very fixed home ranges. And so it was a lot of interesting work understanding how the landscape was being used. Um, from there, I got to come back to New York City for a little while and started my PhD at Columbia University studying um, deforestation in Central Africa. This is me trying to get through a national park in Gabon, and this is right on the river, uh, Congo River outside, trying to stop some of this deforestation from happening inside protected areas. Most of the research I did ended up being remotely sensed, so satellite images of forests across this landscape to try to see how what we're talking about when we talk about protected areas is actually helping. I moved as part of living in New York City, I got to work at the Bronx Zoo in their International Conservation Division for four years, um, helping to create websites that showed off all of the um, wildlife research they were doing all over the world. Um, and from that, I had awesome experiences working with um, practitioners in conservation and trying to understand the projects um, that were helping to save what we liked about our world. 
But why am I here today? So this is Purple Loose Stripes. This is the glamour shot one of our communications people took of me my first summer of starting this research, um, focusing on a beautiful plant. And I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about how I got here, how this research went about and what the big ideas were that would come from it. A lot of what I try to do is to make sure everything I'm studying is replicable in some other way, that other places, other counties, other um, NGOs can take the work I've done and replicate it pretty simply. So an overall outline for what the talk's gonna look like. Unfortunately, I'm going to apologize right off the bat um, and give you a little background on Purple Loose Strife. I'll describe how the mapping we did was done, how the data was all gathered, and each sort of year what we built on to get to the new research where we are. We'll talk a lot about a biological control, in this case beetles. Um, I'll show you a little bit about the data, what we found, what our big outcomes were of the first four years of this research, and then where we're going from here. So the hope is that you'll understand what we built and why we got to where we are after um, the end of this talk. So I started my talks on purple loose strife with an apology because this is a beautiful plant. I'm not gonna deny that. And calling it an invasive plant does seem to have a weighted tone that I think it is a negative. It is very problematic. And unfortunately, whenever you see it driving down the highway now, you're gonna know it's an invasive too. And so I spend a lot of time going back and forth with my students. They all say, oh, it used to look so beautiful driving up to school. And now all I see is these invasive plants everywhere. So I start with the apology. It's been in the United States since probably the mid 1800s. Um, it's native to Eastern parts of Eastern Europe and um, Western Asia and exists in, um, in equilibrium in those ecosystems. That's its native ecosystem. Um, it was often distributed in wildflower seed packs. Um, that's one of the ways it spread. They think it originally arrived in several ways that it might have been in the wool of sheep that came over and then started spreading from there. Um, it will grow in most habitats. It'll grow in ditches along roadsides. It will grow in wetlands where it prefers to grow the most. Um, it was first noted and documented in New York State in the 1960s, and the majority of the research on purple loose strife as a problematic invasive species um, was really begun in the mid to early 1990s by um, Bern Blossy from Cornell University. So why does it become invasive? This sounds like a very loaded term to describe these. And so Lithrum salicaria is the Latin name for purple loose strife. It's considered invasive because it creates a monoculture. It doesn't allow anything else to grow. Anything that's growing in a healthy ecosystem often has a balance that it doesn't overtake it. Everything has its own um, place in the system. It <clears throat> takes over wetlands in a very specific way. So if you look at the bottom photograph, right in the center, um, you can see those are roots. They have woody roots. This is technically classified as a grass, but it has roots that literally require a saw to get through. So the native grasses and cattails, in the, at least in the North Country and in most New York wetlands, tend to have very shallow roots. They don't tend to create this um, woody structure. Um, the other photograph is the roots of goldenrod, which is very frequently found in similar habitats to purple loose strife, um, if not in wetlands with cattails. And you can see both of their roots are very shallow, very simple. Purple loose strife has very complex, very woody roots. And so it can take over a wetland and it has a very insidious sort of trick that by creating these web-like roots, it basically starts to trap more sediment, more soil as the water's flowing through it pushing the water out over and over. So if it's allowed to stand long enough, it will basically turn a wetland into sort of a mushy swamp for a while, and then eventually the water will push almost all the way out. River systems, it's a little different. In New York, it has no natural predators. There is nothing that eats it. It provides no um, food to most um, local uh, herbivores, 
and it has no strong place in our ecosystem. So it becomes an invasive plant when it starts to cause harm and reach a balance that's unsustainable in a new ecosystem. So how did my research start? Um, when I finished my PhD, I, was, I moved back to the North Country, um, back to where my family is, and was starting to adjunct teach. We have four universities near us and was teaching and starting to look at the local landscape. I'd lived, I'd studied in Panama as an undergrad. I'd lived in Kenya. My PhD was in Gabon, but I'd never spent a lot of time really looking at the local landscape and starting to understand it. So now with my degrees in hand, I came home and started looking around with new eyes. And I saw a ecosystem that I didn't quite recognize, that an area, a big wetland that's right by the main road on the way to my grandparents' house looked different than I remembered it as a child. And so I applied for some funding at, from the New York Power Authority's St. Lawrence River Research and Education Fund. I started looking at purple loosestrife and I looked at the um, DEC, the Department of Environmental Conservation website. This is an image from that in 2015, noting the sightings of purple loosestrife. And you can see downstate and along the um, 8790 corridor, there's quite a lot. And across the throughway, there's quite a lot of sightings. But way up where we are, um, there really hadn't been. And forgive my crude drawing, but this is St. Lawrence County in the outlined in red. And at that point, there had only been four confirmed DEC sightings of purple loosestrife. Well, driving around, look, even just cursory looks, I could see that that was just not going to be true and that somebody needed to be collecting data to have some sort of say on how to manage any of this or what was gonna happen. Otherwise, these wetlands that I'd seen that were already starting to look different from my childhood were gonna be different even more so when my nieces were grown up. So in 2017, I had two summer interns, um, undergraduates from SUNY Potsdam. We were able to use a fairly simple app on our phone. Um, it's the Esri Collector app. And we walked um, 166 miles. We walked two sides of the highway for about 88 miles um, on the map in front of you. The blue line is literally the Adirondack Park. The rest is parts of St. Lawrence County. So since purple loosestrife spreads through water, I wanted to look at the wetlands that come through the St. Lawrence and off the St. Lawrence River, and then starting to look at whether it was coming from the Adirondacks or going to the Adirondacks. So I wanted to see if I could do a cross section going from um, southwest to northeast and then um, southeast to the Adirondacks. We collected location data, how many plants there were, the height of those plants. We were asked by New York Power Authority to also collect data about any other plants that were living there. We looked at the type of mowing that the highway was doing, the water, and the rivery, and specifically looking to see if beetles were already present. And I'll start, we did very much stay to highways. We stayed on, um, County highways where it was going to be mowed on either side by the state and um, we would have the right of way to walk on it. So we weren't on private property exactly, but almost all of this is the edge of private land. So we stayed in the Department of Transportation right away, walking along the highway and noting what was on the, the lands. And to just before I get into the GIS data, GIS is Geographic Information Systems. It's a way of taking any information and adding its spatial component. So by saying that we have a location of um, purple loosestrife in this specific place, what else do we know about that place? And so it would tie the information to a database um, that was easy to analyze. And so I had two interns and here's their glamour shot from the summer of my um, communications department came out with me. They were very excited, surrounded by this. They're showing how they use their phones to collect data, but they also sent me photos on a daily basis in case I wasn't out with them. And it was hot. This is in August um, in the North Country. They had to wear their orange vests. And so it wasn't always a happy day, but they did a great job and they're a big part of why we got this off the ground. 
So just a review, there were four sightings. So now I wanna tell you what we found in that first summer. We were just trying to see if we could make this work. How do we do this? We literally are walking the highways trying to keep track of what's out there. So the first summer, that same route, right up at the edge of the um, Adirondack Park and along the St. Lawrence River, we found 664 individual infestations. So the DEC was a little behind that they had four confirmed sites and we were able to give them data just along the highway of over 600 individual sites. We were able to look at how large those infestations are, how much of the distance along the road they created, um, the number of plants in each infestation, and then the total number of plants. Um, the students and I spent time practicing. We would figure out how many are in about a meter and then um, practice extrapolating out to larger sizes. So we were very, we got very good at estimating, you know, even in a large field, how many there were. So now we're armed with a little bit of data. We know that there is more out there that we need to figure out. We didn't really perfect how we were doing it. So we looked at a little more information about this. How dense are these sites? Are we basically just seeing one plant over and over? Are we seeing hundreds of plants? And so we were able to look at the plants per meter. How dense are these um, infestations, which as I mentioned earlier, is the big problem with purple loosestrife because they form these dense stands that then make the wetland much less likely for any other species to take over or to um, compete with the purple loosestrife. And then the last thing we looked at is where were the biggest infestations? Where are these areas where maybe control is going to be our top priority? And so we were able to see some way up to the north near the town of Waddington that had almost a thousand plants and were um, basically spreading down the road for a mile continuously. So maybe those were areas we needed to focus a little bit more on. So we had some analysis, we had some areas. The nice thing from that first year we found, as you can see from Ogdensburg all the way down to um, the edge of St. Lawrence County, there were no very large infestations. So the St. Lawrence River is probably not a big conduit for where this the species is spreading. So we wanted to at least take a little kudos and say, okay, we one thing we were afraid of is not really coming to pass. So the next year I worked with the DEC a little bit and we had some goals. We wanted to see if we what we'd done could be repeated. That's the first mark of a good scientific method. Can you repeat your process and come up with pretty close to the same results? And we wanted to see what other species tend to be found with purple loosestrife even more? So my students got very good at identifying. We can now, after five years, identify close to 100 different species that exist throughout our ecosystem. Um, a little more than half of them are native. The rest are some version of invasive. The other thing we wanted to try to figure out was whether a biological control would be possible. So I mentioned that Bern Blossie at Cornell had been studying this since the mid to early 90s. And they'd had a really good success in the Montezuma Wildlife Refuge with the, these particular leaf-eating beetles. Um, and a biological control, as a definition, is basically bringing in something that already is predetermined to eat this um, plant or to attack the invader you've got. And in this case, um, Galeracella beetles of two different species are primed. They only eat purple loosestrife, which is nice because one of the biggest dangers of bringing in a biological control is that it will eat everything else in your ecosystem. And so you wanna make sure that you're bringing in a very well-matched pair that's not gonna cause any more havoc. And just to give you a sense of how big these beetles are, they're about half the size of your pinky fingernail. So they're quite small and yet they can do pretty impressive damage. So in 2018, we were able to repeat our study and the goal was to figure out, did we do it right the first time? <laughs> a big stress for that year, I'm not gonna lie. And I had two new interns. Um, we went out and we repeated our study, basically making sure the methods worked, identifying the plants a little bit better. And I was, I'm very happy to say our methods worked, that we were able to, we had just a few more sites than we'd seen the previous year. 
that the average size of infestation was about the same. So that also demonstrated that the year to year variability in purple loosestrife was not very high. So that if I didn't quite get out to study it every year, there wouldn't be that much I missed. Um, the number of plants was starting to increase though um, from the average size going from 71 to 80. So it did increase a bit and the total number of plants did increase. It's possible that we got better at um, estimating, so you don't really want to compare two. And because I gave you the first year's glamour shots, this is the one we recreated in the field because the interns are always working a hundred times harder than I have to, and they're the reason all of this gets done. So I want to make sure that I appreciate them. They were also instrumental in getting the beetle analysis out there. So down at the Montezuma Wildlife Refuge, they were willing to collect 1,100 beetles for me. And I get a call on a Friday afternoon, your beetles are here. Okay, wow, what do I do with them? <laughs> no one tells you. And they arrived and they're in these little jars and we had to quickly set up these quadrants so that we could monitor them year after year to see how those were doing. And we went out and were able to release um, 250, 275 at each of the sites where we were able to set up these. So the nice thing is we put them out in the middle of our field site to see if they would survive. Um, because one of the fears is that this far north, and on Saturday I can believe where the fear came from with our 30 below temperatures, is that the beetles wouldn't survive over winter, in which case they'd have to always be introduced every year, which becomes a logistical problem. So. They were willing to give us 1100 and asked us to continue monitoring them for several years after. So now we've got our setup going and now we want to figure out what are we going to do in 2019. Um, we wanted to start to see, could we remove purple loosestrife? Now we've got them mapped pretty well. We know where they are. Could we start to see what are the um, economically viable ways to remove them? Are there economically viable ways to remove them? This could be kind of a more difficult way of doing this. Um, we also wanted to see if we could build a beetle hatchery, build our own, because the DEC, at least in most of New York State, had gotten to the point where the beetles and the purple loosestrife were in pretty good balance. We didn't have pretty much any beetles that we'd found in our first two years of study. There was some evidence they probably existed, but we hadn't found any yet. Um, and so we wanted to see if we could build a beetle hatchery. And I'll tell you about the adventures of that in just a second. And then we wanted to do a third year of monitoring to see if, if the first year is an anomaly and the second year is a coincidence, the third year is a trend. So we're hoping to see if we could figure out that we'd seen a trend with this process. We did update our data collection to make it a little smoother and easier for one or two people to collect. And the nice thing was overall, we had some really interesting findings by three years into our data collection. So by the third year, there actually were many fewer sites. And so all of a sudden it's like, oh, did I hire interns my third year that didn't know what they were doing? Did I screw up somehow? Maybe the first two years were a fluke. But then the next piece of data says that actually the average size of the infestation changed. So it was that some of those, what previously were little sites side by side, so they had to be about 20 meters apart originally, now they're becoming one larger infestation. So they're starting to grow close to each other. One thing I should mention is purple loosestrife can, each individual plant can drop somewhere between 300,000 to a million seeds but they're not wind dispersed for the most part. Traffic can push them a little bit, but they don't really get, they don't float on the wind. Mostly the plant just drops them. And given that they live in wet conditions, they can be transported by water. So knowing how big those infestations are, that's where they're gonna spread from. The other thing was the total distance invaded had increased from just 10% of our route to 13% by the end. And the average number of plants was increasing dramatically. So 2019 was a really good year for purple loosestrife. It was doing well, the sites were getting bigger. So the next piece was to see, could we see spatially? So we go back to 
the data itself? And can we see spatially what we're describing, where those small plots are now coming together to become larger plots? And just from the diagram above on the top, you can see that areas where it was one or two infestations or even three in some places, now is becoming one larger infestation. So it's spreading out from these localized areas. Um, we There are reasons there that each individual year could be different with um, different amounts of rainfall, slightly different temperature, but the variation is not so great between the different years that it would likely be the main reason. So what we're seeing is just purple loose stripes natural inclination to spread. Um, so that was the monitoring we did that year. The eradication research was kind of interesting. We set up plots. There's a wonderful preserve called the Red Barn Preserve right in Morristown, New York, that has um, a heron rookery where there's 60 nests of great blue herons every um, spring, and it's got a beaver pond, and it's perfect environment for purple loosestrife to set up as well, because it's all these wetlands. They've got trails all the way through it. And they were happy to have me set up my research sites because it meant every year I would dig up plants to do more research with it. So we set up 20 plots to basically look at a control. Obviously, you got to start your science with a control. You don't do anything and see if just putting a plot in there was enough to change something. Thankfully, it wasn't. Um, then we wanted to see, can you just cut off the flowers? Is that going to have enough intervention? Maybe you need to cut them to the ground, but you don't need to dig them up. Maybe the beetles will be enough. And finally, and this was the hardest part for my interns that summer, was to dig up down to six inches and eliminate the root structure as well within a one meter plot. We counted all the stems, and this has been going on since 2019. And I'm hopeful that this spring, the data from this specific research will have enough um, power to report. So this is essentially what they'd look like. The minimal um, intervention was cutting just the flowers off. The medium intervention was cutting it to ground level so the plants were gone. And the maximum was dinging it down six inches. So this was what they looked like in 2019. They all look a little different now. We didn't intervene again. We just cut them off that one year to see what was going to happen. But I'm excited. So. This is sort of a photo montage of how to build a beetle hatchery, what the steps go into this. Um, there was a small one built in Warren County at one point, and I used their model to do this. But other than that, and I presented this research at several talks um, across the country, most people haven't been able to do, haven't thought about building their own or haven't been able to, they go and harvest them from the field and then try to move them around to where they need them to be. I'm really grateful. This is, I've done three summers worth of building beetle hatcheries and we've released about 15,000 beetles at this point, but I'll, I'll go through the steps with you. It's kind of interesting. So these are the beetles in the field in late May. Um, we go out, we find them mostly in the Red Barn Preserve. They have a good population because we keep releasing more back there every year, which demonstrates that they also survive the winter. Your very strong backed interns come out and help you dig up plants and you put them in pots. Um, you dig them right up out of the wetland. And the nice thing is by removing them from the wetland, we're also acting as eradication. So we're also removing them from wetlands where we want them to ultimately be gone. And then they are brought back to create our artificial wetland at SUNY Potsdam. Um, they're each put in an individual kiddie pool because they're meant to be fully or partially submerged for all of the summer while they're growing. Each of those pots is then wrapped up um, like a little joint people have mentioned in various points. So I've got all of the pots, each of the kiddie pools holds between eight and nine pots and I've got between six and eight kiddie pools. You seed, I'm sorry, you seed each of these um, initial plants with five to 10 beetles. So you harvest some of the beetles from the field site. You put five to 10 in each of these plants. We keep one kiddie pool with just plants and no beetles because these guys are going to eat these plants like crazy before they're fully grown. So we need more feeder plants to keep them growing. Within about three to four weeks, they produce larvae. 
like this, and you can see how much the larvae eat the plants, um, eat the leaves off the plants. In about a month to six weeks from when we first start, you end up with about a thousand beetles per a um, little less um, per um, plant. And then we use aspirators to collect all of those to bring them out to um, place them in the field where we need them. So building the beetle hatchery was really successful. I won't linger on the small picture of bugs for very long. Um, one of the other things that the Red Barn Preserve, when we set up the field site there, wanted assurance was that if we release the beetles, the beetles wouldn't eat native vegetation. And so what we did was literally tent those beetle sites. Um, and we've tented them every summer since. When we release beetles at the Red Barn Preserve, we put 250 beetles in there. The plots, these are when they were new. The plots are basically almost buried at this point under um, grass and mud as the wetland flows through. And so it goes right to the ground. And then we take it off about a month later. And what you're looking at in the picture on the right is native um, spotted touch me not, um, bittersweet nightshade. And then the brown is all the purple loosestrife that has been eaten to nothing. It's been eaten to be completely devastated. And all of the other vegetation inside the nets is completely fine. There's no evidence of any herbivory on any of the other plants. They literally had no other options and they still didn't eat the other plants. And we did it in other varieties and um, they may not like these specific plants, but the other sites had multiple different kinds of plants and nothing had any evidence of being eaten by our beetles. Um, the other thing 2019 we were able to do, um, I am a certified drone pilot to start looking at these because sometimes it's harder to get into these wetlands than just being by the road. And while people are eager to let us um, map the purple loosestrife, it's not always easy to walk into the wetland, but it's fairly straightforward to um, fly the drones over them. So the picture on the right is an example of what one drone flight could capture um, in as part of our um, field sites. And as you see on the bottom picture, that's just 50 feet worth of purple loosestrife. If I can continue to zoom in, but then it loses some of its um, overall impact to show you, but the resolution from these drone images is less than a centimeter. So I can see individual plants, I can count individual plants. We haven't written the algorithms to let this do it easily, but it is the next step we can go on. One of my extraordinary interns also noticed something in the field, and this is one of the best parts of doing field research with students, is he's just sitting in the car one day, we're driving between sites, and he's like, you know, Dr. Rogers, when we see purple loosestrife on one side of the road and we see a culvert, so like a pipe that goes underneath the road, it seems like we often see it on the other side of the road too. And that's definitely the best kind of science is you notice something funny and then you wonder why. And Nolan did a great job of figuring all this out and starting to look at it. He literally drove our entire route again for his fall project to map all of those individual culverts to see if we could figure it out, to put the spatial part of this all together and say, okay, when there's a culvert present, is it more likely to be on both sides of the road? It is purple loosestrife to be on both sides of the road, such that culverts are actually a way that they're spreading as they drop their seeds and spread them through. So all of this big, 2019 was a big research year for us to get new projects started, which was great. 2020 shut a few things down. We did want to start in a new area to expand our research. We weren't able to build a beetle hatchery, um, but I did have two terrific interns. We stayed distanced outside with masks as the whole world shut down. Everybody had to show up to their own part of work each day. But we added another 60 miles, 66 miles to the route. So we've basically cut off and created this fun triangle that goes all along the St. Lawrence River in St. Lawrence County, excuse me, right up to the St. Regis Mohawk Reservation in the north and then back down to um, 
the blue line at the Adirondack Park. And this time we incorporated Potsdam, which is where SUNY Potsdam is located, so that all of that area could be used for um, classwork when I was teaching this. And so this is a little harder to compare because it's not the same region, but it looks like this as a area is equally as infested. Um, it has um, larger infestations for the most part, but it has a huge number of plants considering it's uh, almost 80 kilometers smaller than the new route, uh, than the old route, it still has a lot of plants. So this is a reasonable area that if not more important to focus on our research. So in 2021, we've got a little bit more of the COVID um, issue under control. All the students were vaccinated and able to work outside. We wanted to basically map both routes because now I was able to hire five interns, the biggest summer I had. Um, and expand where we were monitoring beetles. So we're going to go back and do a lot of those things. So the beetle hatchery was built and expanded. Um, it did a really good job. The students did an amazing job um, aspirating all of them, cleaning it up, building the beetle hatchery. And though it was an extremely hot summer, they had a great time getting it all collected. Um, there's freshmen through seniors here, um, and they worked really well together. They were out in the field in different groups. Obviously, I couldn't be with both groups on the same day, so I went out alternating with them. This is them learning how to use the field guides that they've created for all of the in local species that we encounter. Um, and they mapped all 165 miles of road, both sides of it. So all together, they walked 300 miles of roads. And this is where it makes it a little easier to compare. You can see the two different routes. Um, the older route was in yellow, the newer route adds on in blue. And we did have data we could compare to see what was happening. And purple loosestrife was definitely still expanding. Um, so it went from just 540 sites in 2019 to 611, so it's still well within the realm of being stable in our area. In the north route, it was also relatively stable. Our methods were working and easily repeated, so it was nice to see. In some, it's very early days to see if that data is correct. Some areas, it does seem to be declining, um, but it's a question of where we've been dealing with the beetles. So the big number to look at, though, is this one. So the total number of plants from 2019 to 2021 did go down in both areas, and it went down substantially. At this point, we've released more than 15,000 beetles across this area. Um, in all of those large areas that we targeted, um, we were able to see where the largest infestations were with the least amount of herbivory. And so how were those areas coming into this? Again, this is only one year of data to look at how the beetles are impacting it, but I think there's more detail to be there. So in 2022, this went really well. We did not map the um, route again, but we built another beetle hatchery that expanded one more time on the originals. Um, I had one terrific intern who did most of the work on the beetles. Apparently now our artificial wetland is drawing in wildlife as I picture. This is literally in the center of our campus. The deer found us in 2022 and hung out right outside um, our office. And the young man on the bottom right or left is the intern from the previous picture you saw. He now works for the St. Regis Mohawk Reservation um, and as their um, invasive species specialist. So he got a job directly from doing this. And he texted me one day, he's like, hey, Dr. Rogers, I know it's that time of year, are the beetles coming out? And I was like, actually, yeah. And so he's holding a thousand beetles in those four containers and he's gonna take them, to, he took them to the St. Regis Mohawk tribe and was able to release them on areas where they know they have large infestations or purple loose strife. And so, this work and working with Sam means I'll be able to go forward and hopefully this summer I wrote a grant to try to work with um, the St. Regis Mohawk tribe to take the work we've been doing and replicate it with them. 
so that they'll be able to do it on their own. Um, as you can see, building artificial wetlands. Sorry, we had a massive cleanup, so our site looks much more full of garbage than you'd expect. Um, but so that they can replicate this and control the um, invasive plants on their own. Just a note about all the other plants we were able to identify. So the way this worked, um, for every species of plant within a meter of purple loosestrife was put on a list and um, measured. The first year, we were pretty good at about 55 of them. Everything else went into other or unidentifiable. Um, we did collect samples and were able to identify more of them in the lab um, using field guides and just texting photos to naturalists. The next year, we were even better at identifying them using the first year's field guide. So we have a very um, local specific field guide made for this area by doing this work. Um, we use the Picture This app, but there are now, thankfully, since I started this work, there weren't that many apps that let you just identify plants, but we use the Picture This app for most of what we do. Um, there are at least two or three others that are also free and very easy to do. Um, so the final piece that I wanted to talk about just is what did we publish that goes with this? Um, in spring of 2022, um, two colleagues and I were able to take all of this data from all of those brilliant interns and turn it into an analysis. And what we found, some of it was expected, but we demonstrated it and found that it was more likely to be found in wetlands. They were larger and they were more dense in wetlands. We took the start of Nolan's work and were able to look at it in more detail um, that culverts were absolutely a predictor of purple loosestrife. Anywhere along roads, they were more likely to create a infestation and to allow that infestation to spread further, especially across roads where wetlands were existing on both sides. We did find very clearly that movement is in a what's called a patch and spread model. So it doesn't necessarily blow in a specific direction. You can't predict the direction it will spread. It just spreads out from each plant that drops its seeds further and further away. One of the initial theories I had looking at it or hypotheses I had was that the roadside mowing was dragging those seeds further and further. And based on our analysis, mowing wasn't part of what was spread, wasn't the most likely reason for the spread in the directions we found. Um, I am working with um, Fort Drum, which is a military base not far from here that works on invasive, has a huge invasive plant um, team. And they're gonna work with me in the summer of 2024 because you gotta spend out two, plan out two years in advance to work with the military um, to see exactly how mowing influences on the spread of purple loosestrife. They're willing to take some of their mowers and um, mow in a very specific way so that I can track where the plant pieces go. So I'm very excited for that. So as I said, the next steps, um, we want to finish the beetle analysis. Um, I'm currently working with a wonderful young woman, um, Mackenzie Biggie, on looking at all of this beetle analysis. We've been monitoring all of these sites for three years, and what kind of information can we find with that? Um, the, the paper that I published last spring, um, which is open source, you can find it if you Google just mapping the purple menace. Um, we want to update that data. So that data looked at 2017 to 2019. Now we have two more summers worth of data. This summer, I hope to work with um, students again and work with Aquasosny, um, St. Regis Mohawk tribe to help them plan for monitoring and eradicating purple loosestrife at that their site, and of course, to build another beetle hatchery. The more we can dig out of the Red Barn Preserve, the less they'll be there. And then to build on this work to expand strategic mowing plans for both Fort Drum and um, the state. So why does this matter to a New York City audience? In closing, so invasive plants of most kinds can be found everywhere. I know that Purple loosestrife has been spotted more and more, especially along roadsides, which are fairly ubiquitous in and around the New York City area. And those areas where roads are coming into New York, especially along all the waterways, 
are really vulnerable to these kinds of purple loose, these kinds of invasions, especially purple loose strife. But the other nice thing is you have a more moderate climate, so the beetles will probably be the right intervention to bring those in. There's another species of beetle that they're studying to try to work on this. Most of this is going to take citizen science, which is basically people who observe these things and then decide to contribute to a group to work on this. There's a terrific um, program through the New York Natural History um, program called IMAP Invasives, where it's an app you can download and you can report all of the data on any invasive plants you perceive you found. They'll um, keep track and all of the data is recorded. So with management of purple loosestrife and any invasive plant, the first thing you wanna do is to prevent it. So if you can get a single plant and remove it before it has a chance to drop 300,000 seeds, before it has a chance to spread to that next level, you're doing the best possible timing of your work. After that, you wanna do what you can to eradicate it. Where we are, we're at the stage of needing to control purple loosestrife and ultimately to manage it as part of our ecosystem. It's unlikely we will get to the point where we can eliminate it from the ecosystem, but my goal and hopefully the goal of all of the um, people who work on invasive plants that don't actually harm physically people is to manage them as part of the ecosystem. So a big thank you to all of the people who funded this work and supported me through this, especially all of um, the interns that I have worked with and my colleagues in publishing. And I would be happy to take any questions. We'll stop sharing. Awesome, thank you so much, Jessica. That was, I know that was very interesting. We've already got some comments in here about how much people enjoyed that. So thanks very much. Um, if you guys have any questions, um, if you haven't already put them in the chat, feel free to do that. Um, or if you have something you'd like to ask verbally, you can raise your hand. Um, we're gonna go through some of these ones that are in here first. Um, I just wanna say it's really amazing, like great that you're doing this work, especially given what you showed in the beginning about how if you look at just kind of what records they have, it looked like there wasn't really that much. Because right. especially, you know, plants that there's so many of them, you you know, I, I know sometimes I feel like it's like, well, it's just the same thing over and over again. I don't want to keep noting this down, but that's actually like really important. It's extremely helpful. Yeah, that, that is a good point. And you, the big thing I've always assumed is somebody must be taking care of this. But purple loose strife is not going to poison us. It's not likely to kill any of our pets directly. Um, it is going to be a slow problem that we should deal with. And so it doesn't end up high on the priority for the DEC. It's always on their list. It's, you know, I think in their top four most years, but it doesn't necessarily reach the levels of funding to eradicate. And so yes, citizen science and reporting these kinds of things can be very helpful. All right, so we've got some questions about the plants and some questions about the beetles. Sure. Um, so let's see, actually, um, well, Rick, you had a bunch, you had the, most, some of the questions about the beetles. So if you want to go ahead and unmute, you can ask your question. So um, is it possible for citizen scientists to get a hold of these beetles um, under some sort of controls and um, apply them? to their particular area where they live. I live in Ulster County uh, in Accord and uh, to apply them to um, the beginning of outbreaks that we may have in the area. Uh, is, that, is that doable or do we need DEC involvement, approval, question mark? <laughs> I think that's a great idea. Um, I don't believe you need, D I don't think there are regulated species by the DEC because they're just out in, they're meant to live in the environment now with purple loosestrife. Um, so in terms of getting a hold of them, I think you'd have to write to me and I could mail you a set next summer, uh, somewhere in the third week of July. But um, because they're insects, they're not regulated that I'm aware of in this particular way because they're not deemed a threat and they've been studied for more than 20 years in this way. Um, but no, because in most of the state they've reached a equilibrium, they're not harvesting them in the same ways. So I don't think there is a program to release them more to the general public. Um, but 
it's likely your soil, your county soil and water conservation district might have a plan they might be working with. So I would suggest reaching out to them. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And I did see your comment in the chat that the beetles are, they thought that the beetles would be too susceptible to the cold because their life cycle is, um, they burrow down as larvae. So the beetles I release become, they lay eggs and become larvae. And then that larvae in August, September burrows down into the ground and overwinters as larvae, then emerges right around May when the ground thaws and comes back up. And they thought that the larvae may not survive, but we also haven't had up here the deep freezes that we've had for many years, which is a similar problem with controlling ticks. We need a week's worth of 20 below temperatures to eliminate the ticks in the same way. And so I think they thought that the beetles might not survive, but we don't have those freezing temperatures in the same way. So at least so far the beetles are surviving. And some of the places where I first released the beetles, that had none, they had no evidence of beetles, they had no beetles that we ever saw. And once I started releasing them, it took three years before I would show up and there would already be beetles there. So it was nice that first year, I'll admit I'm a nerd and I love my research and I was so excited to see them when I arrived at the field site, that they'd already been there. Um, so some more questions about the beetles. Um, Will they eat other Lithraceae or other, like within the genus or within the family? Um, or were those not included in those test plots? They weren't included in the test plots because we have very few um, Lithrum species up here. We have swamp leaf strife that does live in the area. Um, I don't believe, at least from the other tests they've done, that they found that they ate any of the other Lithrum species, but I, I'm not entirely sure. They it's don't eat any of the native ones, although. I did know bittersweet nightshade is definitely not native, but they also didn't eat that. It's really amazing how there's these very close kind of like relationships yeah. between this one species of plant, this one species of, of insect. Yes. Uh, that's really amazing. Uh, all right, um, Jack, looks like you're up next. Hi there. Thank you. This is a wonderful talk and um, I just love your thoughtful, rigorous scientific research. It's really great. Thank you. Um, my, yeah, my question is, um, I live on Roosevelt Island which I don't know if you know about Rose. Okay, so we're surrounded on the east and the west by the channels of the East River. Right. I'm a member of a garden club, a community garden club that includes about um, 150 plots. And so we have purple loose strife in our garden. It just pops up here and there and it's very difficult to get rid of. Mm -hmm. And one of the rationales that we use to encourage people to get rid of it is that it may spread um, into the East River right. and infest along the way. Do you yeah. think that's a plausible possibility? <laughs> it's an extremely likely possibility, yes. Um, okay. Yes, they, an individual plant when full grown, so about year five or six, the first couple of years you have, you have a good chance. It's unlikely a one or two or three year old plant will release very much. But by the time it's about five years old, that plant can release 300,000 seeds that can travel very far and get well into the wetlands around the area. Right. Yeah, yeah well, we're about 200 yards maybe from water, but that's- A good rain, a little um, parking lot to spread it through and there it is in the drains okay. heading into the river. Okay, you've answered my question. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. That uh, Thank you for the work on that. That's great. Uh, you're welcome, thanks. The, the early intervention is, is important. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, in relation to that, you, talk, you talked about like individual plants mm -hmm. um, because it has the, the rhizome like kind of growth. What do you, what would you call an individual plant? Is it like, will you like the stem or? An individual stem, yes. So we, for our first initial um, study, we, and since any individual infestation has to be at least 20 meters from any other infestation. A big part of that was that was the resolution of our um, initial GPS units. They've gotten a lot better, so we could have changed it. But then we knew that every point we were plotting could be individually recognized. And it seems like that's well within what the average um, bluff, uh, gust of wind or a good rain could blow it is about or less than 20 meters. And the literature supports that. It, go, it spreads about no more than 10 meters from itself. 
So we used that as the standard. All right, Carol, you have your hand raised. You can go. Go ahead. Yes. Um, I'm an ecologist at SUNY New Paltz. Um, ah. It's um, exit 18 of the New York State Thruway. Yep. And when you get off the thruway, there were at one time really extensive stands of purple loosestrife. And all over that area, there were large stands. And then I assume because of the introduction of the beetles, it was substantially reduced and everybody was commenting on how wow. much it had been reduced. But now it seems to be increasing again. And I'm wondering what's going on. Are the beetles still there? Is there something else that's happening that's causing it to flourish again? There's nothing specific. Um, my guess is it would be a normal ecological predator prey cycle where the purple loosestrife booms and then the beetles boom after and eat too much and the purple loosestrife dies back and then the beetles die back and then the purple loosestrife comes back up. So it is finding a balance. It's just understanding what that balance is meant to look like. I don't think there's anything else in particular affecting them. The only thing in our area that I've noticed more um, and the literature has a little bit on this, is salting rose actually makes them, is very good for purple loosestrife. Um, mm. They are okay with the um, change in the soil with um, increased salting. So the only thing I could think of is if, is if that area increased the type of salting it was doing on the highway, um, it might have had a sort of boom effect. But as long as there were beetles there, and there probably that. were, um, they will bring it back into balance over time, or they should. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Great. All right, we got a couple uh, questions left here in the chat. Um, so William asked, um, did cutting off the flowers have any effect? Um, but I suppose that that study is not kind of completed yet with the, those results, right? That study is not completed, but I can tell you anecdotally that each of the effects definitely had, each of the treatments definitely had some effect. I'm really curious what the effect is going to be at the five-year mark, which will be next year. Um, my intern is, and I just started really pulling the data out today, in fact, to start looking at some of that. And in some plots, there's very little change, and especially in the controls, which is what we wanted to see. Um, the big thing was cutting it down to the ground had an effect, and cutting the flowers had an effect. It, there is a difference from the control from what we could see. I just don't know how big that difference is yet. Nice, but that that could be very promising because of yeah, course we want we want that like low low level of uh, exactly. Yeah. I, I, from the research we've done, um, I do think strategic mowing could be a big help as opposed to a potential hindrance, because if you can mow before the seeds set, you'll eliminate a year's worth of um, growth, you Elim eliminate a year's worth of reproduction, if you will. Um, but the problem is when the DOT has to mow at a specific time and they actually mow after there are seeds, and I think that is causing um, a big movement problem. There is some debate in the literature whether the cuttings from purple loosestrife, as opposed to the seeds, can regenerate. Um, some papers actually pretty evenly split. Some papers say yes, in a laboratory setting, you can grow, um, regrow purple loosestrife from cuttings. Some say you need to have, um, you need to start from seed. So um, I'm hoping to look more detailed into that with the mowing research next summer. And that actually relates to another question that we had um, from Vivian about properly disposing of bees. Um, that is a really good question. Um, I wouldn't recommend disposing of them in compost. I wouldn't recommend disposing of them by burning them. Although if you can do it in a very hot fire, like backyard fire, which I guess is not exactly New York City safe at this point, but um, outside the city, that would work as long as the fire was hot enough to burn quickly and not just push the seeds up into the air. Um, otherwise, and what we do is we dispose of them in garbage bags, unfortunately. They do go into the landfill and break down. I try to have them break down in our um, near our wetlands as much as they can before they go into the field. 
but they will regrow from cuttings. And one of the things we found the hard way and could not believe what we saw the first time we did, the first summer when we built the beetle hatchery, we brought those plants into the um, wetland, into the artificial wetland. And then when we released the beetles, we knew there were still a lot of beetles on one particular plant. So rather than um, trying to get all the beetles off with an aspirator, which you have to do every individual beetle, um, we just put the beetle into the field, like where we knew we wanted the beetles to be released. We just dumped the whole plant out there. That plant fully regrew. Um, it was almost dead by every measure. It had hundreds of beetles still on it and it just cemented itself back in the ecosystem. We know it was the plant we released because we were tired at the end of the day and it wasn't exactly in the field we wanted it to be in. It was about 10 feet from where the mowing should have taken place. So we know it just regrew right from where it was. So unfortunately, garbage bags is the best version I can offer you right now, but it is something I'm trying to figure out because digging them all up and then dumping them in the garbage doesn't seem like a great use of environmental space or time. All right, we got a couple more here. Um, from Jill, uh, was wondering about the timing of the beetles. Do the beetles eat the plant before it flowers? Yes, the beetles are kind of brilliant and it's one of the reasons they end up being in such good balance in the original ecosystem. So the beetles focus predominantly on eating um, the primary um, flower, the primary meristem. So some of the ways we study them is we go out in June and measure the plants to see how they look, what is the, how tall are the plants gonna be. We give them two months to grow and flower and then we go back to the same sites and we measure their height again. And this time we count all of the inflorescences or all the flowering um, offshoots. And then we measure the primary, um, primary flower on every plant. And for the most part, the beetles have eaten the primary flower on almost every plant where we've released beetles. So the measurements, the way we know what's happened is the measurements on all of those are zero when we go back and look at the data. Um, it does cause the plants to create a candelabra effect where they grow out and produce more inflorescences sideways instead of high. But the nice thing is that means they're not able to spread quite as far. They're still spreading into their same ecosystem, same um, 10 meters that they've always spread in instead of getting taller and able to spread further out. Um, the hope is that removing the flowers will be enough. But the beetles very specifically eat the primary inflorescences. They like, they will eat as much of those as they can. Um, so having the more beetles will keep the ecosystem and the plants back in balance. Very interesting. What, uh, speaking of this beetle, what is this, is that the species of the beetle? Cause we know the genus, but I wasn't sure. The, I can type it so that I don't that um, say it. There's two of them. So it's Galericella. Alamarensis and Pusilla. So those are the two species. So it's Galericella calamarensis, or I may have had the accent in the wrong place, and Galericella pusilla. Both are leaf-eating beetles. And they're almost identical. One has a slightly darker stripe on its back. Um, I am fairly certain, though I wouldn't swear it, we have both species up here. Great, thank you. All right, Rick, uh, if you have another question, you can go ahead and ask. Dr. Rogers, are you working on stilt grass? Not yet, no. <laughs> um, I do spend a lot of time seeing all the Phragmites, all the other invasive plants, and I have about, I have maps of about 40 other plant invasive plants that I could share to anybody who's got the time to do more research. Um, it's very disheartening to see how much, especially Phragmites, I saw the discussion in the chat, how much Phragmites there is up here. But one of the nice things, and this is part of why I really enjoy doing this work, is you're out walk, uh, walking on the highways in our bright orange vests, and occasionally somebody who has power in one of our local municipalities will pull over and ask us, what the heck are we doing? Some people say it less nicely, but usually those people go on their business pr pretty quickly. Um, and two summers ago, the 
mayor of the town of Waddington drove over and asked what we were doing because he'd heard about these people who do this invasive plant research because my interns have been out every August for five years. And um, he asked how we would manage the, their roadsides in the village. And we said, you need a backhoe and he, to take out the Phragmites, to take out the purple loosestrife in these particular areas. And they did. They put in pollinator plants instead. It was a small area, but it was about the right, the person with the right knowledge meeting the right person with the power at the right time. And working with one of my colleagues from SUNY Potsdam, they were able to do that. So their roadsides in this one part of the village are just pollinator plants now. And they've removed with a backhoe the Phragmites they had and the purple leaf strife that was gonna grow with it. Um, I have a question about the, I actually have two questions, one about the beetles and one about other associates. So for the beetles, are there any inadvertent, undesirable effects that they have on spreading purple leaf strife? Like, are they good pollinators of the plant and then they also eat it? Or, um, no, they mostly, by the time the flowers bloom, they have already finished their life cycle and are all their way back underground. The, so the, the flowers themselves are actually okay for pollinator species. They do okay keeping them alive from what I've heard. They're, I am not an aficionado of honey, but I've heard that the honey they produce from um, poll being pollinated by purple loosestrife is not good. Is not desirable. Um, so um, beekeepers would rather not have purple loosestrife nearby. As a option, bees will absolutely use it though. So it is something that pollinators will use, but I imagine it's not. And you had another question, Tommy? Yeah, sorry. I was um, for plants that are in the area, have you seen any more native, like resilient native plants um, in these wetland areas? Um, just like sort of anecdotally, like are there plants that are more susceptible to being pushed out by purple leaf strife and others that are more resilient? Yeah, yeah, no. mm, that's a really good question. Um, so Unfortunately, Phragmites is much more resilient, and Phragmites and um, purple loose strife can fairly evenly share a wetland for quite a while. Um, ultimately, purple loose strife will push out the Phragmites if given enough time. Um, the cattails are sus particularly susceptible. So, one of the debates, unfortunately, that is not clear at this point in our area, and it's something that I need to add to what we look at as we go out and look at cattails. There are native cattails to northern New York. There are also um, invasive cattails in the area, and in a strange way, they also produce a hybrid. So it's thought that most of what we have in the North Country is this hybrid. So it becomes much more of an ethical con conundrum about what do you do with a hybrid invasive that is actually continuing some of the genetics of the native cattails, but also has um, some of the genetics of this invasive cattail. And I don't know if it's actually goes as far as to be considered invasive as opposed to just non-native. It doesn't, it doesn't outcompete the native cattail in the same way as some of the other invasive plants that we really struggle to control, but it isn't a native plant either. So it's about figuring out which ones belong in the ecosystem. But I think we have a lot of the um, hybrid cattails in the area, but cattails get pushed out really fast. They need very specific kinds of moving water through the area. They need to have looser soils and open areas, sort of a muddier soil than, um, the average purple loosestrife. They can't grow in purple loosestrife roots, whereas Phragmites definitely can. Um, it'll survive in it. So sometimes we've pulled out, when we dig up the plants and use a saw to get out their roots, my students can never believe it until the first time they've had to use a saw in the ground, in the underwater basically, in these wetlands to get a plant that looks like a grass out of the wetland. Um, but sometimes we pull purple or pull Phragmites right out with it. So, Greg Mighties will do quite well with it. 
but there are no like native species that you've seen that are just more resilient than others. Goldenrod seems to be pretty resilient. Goldenrod is really native to our area and spreads pretty well through it and can use almost the same um, landscapes. They don't tend to exist strictly in wetlands. Obviously, cat or goldenrod exists in fields and they don't have the same requirements for the water. So they're a little more resilient and broader areas. Um, unfortunately for my interns, until purple loosestrife or goldenrod blooms, they can look quite similar to a student starting out. So we spend some time talking about all the different ways the plants are identified and how to look at them. And, they get pretty good at it pretty fast. It helps that they have very specific list of plants that it's going to be um, to make it easier. Yeah, building that was one of the best outcomes of this project is really building on it every year. So we have an absolute um, local field guide for plants, both native and invasive, which you rarely find in the same book. Thank you. It's great to be able to, to, to build on your research. I think a lot of times people do do a study and that's it. And they're like, well, if I got to do it again, here's what I would do. And like, you right. actually get to kind of have that iterative process happening. Yeah, it's a great factor. I've been really well supported at SUNY Potsdam. And one of the things they really value is when we're able to incorporate our undergraduates into research and doing research with them. So, and I've been lucky, I've had a great series of students that have been interested in doing the work, even when the work is being outside at 80 degrees in August on the side of the highway. Um, they put in the work and I think they really understand even their small piece of doing it isn't contributing to a bigger picture. All right, so we just have a think so one or two quick questions left here at the end. And if anyone uh, speak now or forever, or, or you can always email Jessica too. Yes, please. Don't be a, <laughs> um, so Ruth asked where the beetles are from originally, and if I'm not mistaken, they're kind of widespread across Eurasia. Um, yeah. The purple loosestrife is also kind of widespread, and they yeah. to co-occur. Okay. Um, William asked if you encountered any foxtail barley. I did not, unless that's the name for something that I named it something else. Um, I'd be happy to share the name with you. Foxtail is we did find something that is named like a foxtail, um, but foxtail barley, I did not. Um, I'd have to look at the list. It is alphabetized. We just called it foxtail, which could be something else. I was just, I just wondering something. Oh, thank you so much for this incredible talk. And I just uh, wanted to ask, uh, is it, uh, do we know any native uh, fauna that are somehow reliant at this point on the purple loosestrife? And uh, if not, is there any plant that was more abundant in the past that we might in encourage in some way in its place? That's a really good question. Um, I haven't looked at it in exactly that way, but um, there aren't any native um, plants, I'm sorry, native fauna that rely on it. Um, as I mentioned, some pollinators are using it where that's an option. Um, the big thing that it's starting to do is, so in these very dense wetlands that purple loosestrife creates, it's starting to push out migratory waterfowl. So in our area, especially, we're a huge stopover place for um, migratory waterfowl that move to Canada in the summer and then cross back to the southern states in the winter. Um, and when purple loosestrife really invades a big uh, wetland, it takes over and leaves very little room for any of that fauna um, to land and to fish. It pushes fish out quite quickly if there were any fish in that area. It pushes out some of the macro invertebrates don't have any space because of that really intensive root structure. Um, what was a normal wetland or an uninvaded wetland has a lot more space. It had the cattails and the um, birds can move between the cattails, they can land. Cattails don't tend to form a blanket, they tend to form along the ridges. 
they don't want to be as submerged. So if you have a channel of moving water or a deeper area of water, the cattails don't tend to fill it in completely. So migratory ducks and birds would have open water in that area. Purple loosestrife is changing those dynamics of the ecosystem. So preventing them from getting in and really eliminating that because they're willing to be much more submerged for longer periods of time. And there wouldn't be as easy an area. So being able to promote even this um, uh, hybrid cattail that we've got now is and really making sure that it's able to um, spread where it needs to can be really important. I don't think there are some other native grasses and flowers that do a better job, but promoting anything that the migratory waterfowl especially can take advantage of is really important. Any of the birds that can work in the ecosystems in these wetland ecosystems is going to make a big difference. Mm -hmm. Just you. to supplement what's removed by having purple loosestrife there. Mm -hmm. That's a really good idea. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you. Well, and just to close it off, actually, there's the question that Rick put in here about, um, it, would you find that when the loosestrife is eliminated that the wetlands will kind of go back to how they were. But what I have could say along with that is how do you prevent reinfestation? If you're able to even remove it completely, which is unusual if you get to a certain level, um, the Montezuma Wildlife Refuge is one of the best examples of this. So they very much in the mid to late 90s had blanket monocultures as far as you could see. So you're driving down the throughway between Syracuse and Rochester, I believe. And on both sides of the road, really far, all you saw were thick stands of purple loosestrife. They worked very hard to clear out some manually, but really invested in uh, bringing the beetles back. And now when you look at the wetlands, it's much more of a mixture and you get that ringing feature where the center of the wetland is open water and the edges of it are plants again. It's a mixture of cattails and purple loosestrife, but now it's back in a balance where they can't actually, they don't feel like they can afford to even harvest beetles because it will throw that ecosystem back out of balance. So they don't have enough extra beetles to harvest at this point, which I guess is a good thing. They succeeded, they got where they wanted to be. And so we're working on spreading some of that up here too. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jessica, for coming and talking to us. And thanks, everyone, for coming and having some great questions. Um, keep an eye out for the Purple Loosestrife. Um, if you have the IMAP invasives, you can put it on there. Yeah. If not, you can put it on a naturalist. Um, yeah. yeah. There are great options out there. Thank you so much for coming. I appreciate talking to everybody. Thank you, everybody. So have a, a good rest of your night. And hopefully we'll see you guys again soon.